Well, Mark and I were going to talk a little bit about the realities of the present and ways um, that we're responding to that. Uh, I'm a writer myself, so I have some kind of some thoughts about these. These are the things that I think about as well. So I'm just going to fire into some uh, kind of thoughts around that, Mark. Yeats said, things reveal themselves passing away. We're losing the glaciers, we're losing the forests in Siberia, California and Australia to fire. We're losing access to clean water, we're losing lakes and rivers, we're losing species all the time. We've lost the Holocene and are in the Anthropocene, and we're galloping towards a three degree warmer world. So in the midst of all this epic destruction, are we nonetheless being given the chance to see something, to see something in nature, to see something in ourselves? Is something being revealed to you about how to live, how to be human in this time? How to, re how to react, how to, re how to see nature, I think, really. Does, is nature being more revealed to you as a result of the crisis? Well, I guess, well, I guess when, you're, when you get closer to loss, anything, you start to appreciate it more. Actually, can, I, can everyone hear me back in? Yeah? Um, good. Um, yeah, like I had a funny thing. I am a friend of mine. Um, a couple of years ago, I was going to do a book tour at the time. And, uh, and I was kind of thinking what the message, what message I was going to bring on the book tour. And my friend was telling me about his mum. His mum was about to die. Um, and his. Um, his brother was still making plans for Christmas for, for his mum, um, and my friend was like quite upset because he's, you know, he, he was like, she's a complete denial. And at the same time, I was reading a book called um, *The Unhabitable Earth* by David Wallace Wells, and I was like, when you actually when you actually listen to what he's saying in that book, you realise the depth of the problem we have right now. You you know that no matter what we do, some things are going to die. Um, I realised was I realised I had a kind of a weird. Uh, kind of climate denialism. I wasn't facing up to the fact that things were actually dying right now. Um, and it, asked, it made me ask the question of myself: like, How do I want to relate um, to the world of living and dying in the time that I've got with, with my mother, um, which is the earth we're on? Um, and I think when you get, I think when you realise that, like it, that book's a different effect on different people. And um, some people go into despair reading that book. I had the opposite reaction. I was like, I've got some time left with this beautiful thing. Um, how would I want to live my life if, if, I, if I actually accepted that I've only got some time left? What would I want to do with my time? I think that's a really important question for us to ask because we're all just here for a short time. Um, how do we want to be in the world with the time we've been given? Um, and so I came to the conclusion I actually want to live in the most beautiful way I can. And what beauty means is obviously quite subjective. But like to engage in every single moment of every day in the most beautiful way that you can. Like imagine waking up like that every day. How to be the most beautiful person I can in the time we've got left. Because things are gonna happen regardless of what we do now. Like we can plant fuck tons of trees, you know, like it's and that's gonna be great. That's a beautiful expression of how to be in the world right now. Um, but things are gonna go down. Um, no matter what we do. So the question is how are we gonna live our lives from this point on? How beautiful can we be as a people? Our job isn't really necessary to plant flowers, it's, it's to bloom. We should be trying to bloom as people. Um, so yeah, so it's, it, the, the fact that I know things are dying has given me a greater appreciation of what's still left. And we should be, like, instead of going through our days thinking about the bills or thinking about all the problems and all the negative stuff, we should be going and kind of just actually paying attention to the world around us, properly paying attention. Because that's what, that's what we're lacking right now. We're so in our heads most of the time. We get back in our bodies and start paying attention again to the, the world that's left. So maybe just tell us a little bit about that when you're working in, in your garden or you're chopping wood or you're in the, in the life without technology, which is how you live. Um, just tell us a little bit about that paying attention. What does that look like or feel like? I'm not always very good at paying attention. I'm, I'm pretty good at talking about it, but I, 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 fail, I fail just as much as the next person actually paying attention. I think it does actually really help to give up screens. Like I'll be very honest. Um, like I, I came from a very different world. Like I, I was in business for years. Um, I was kind of I used tech to write for many years. Um, I, I feel like my first few books, should, the authors should be Mark Boyle and Microsoft Word. <laughs> because I think Microsoft Word is responsible for most of the things I wrote. It completely changes how you write. 
Um, but I, I, then I moved to, um, in around 2016, I decided to give up all electricity, all screens. Um, and the effect that's had on me is like the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. After speaking to her. Um, yeah, it's, <laughs> um, sorry, microphone. Um, I love you very much. Um, yeah, like the best thing I've done is give up screens. I gave up money years ago as well for three years. That was the, that was the other good thing I've done in my life. Um, it seems like a, these things seem like a sacrifice at first. Like we give up something. Um, I hate using the term like you know. Um, Connecting, like, I don't really like connecting with nature as a kind of a thing, you know, it's just like, so I, I use the phrase, kind of giving up money, giving up tech. Um, and what we kind of forget when we say we're giving up, just say if you, if alcoholics, for example, are described as, uh, um, or, uh, as giving up, people who, people who are recovering from alcoholism are, are um, just often described as giving up um, the booze. Um, but what they're never described really is what, they, what they're bringing into their life, like, Better relationships with everything around them, you know. I said the same as that. Like when you give up screens, first you think oh, I'm going to sacrifice all the things the screens do for me. But like what you get in return is so much better. Um, you get a, a much deeper relationship with the things around you. Your head's not stuck in the screen all day. You're not there, you know, when somebody's talking to you. Like I've heard, I've heard stories of people in bed with their lovers, um, and the, the person's on the on the screen. I just think it's that whole it's come to like are we actually like in bed with the person we think of as the most beautiful being in the world, and on our screen, completely distracted from that. So when you strip away these distractions, you get back to reality. Um, and yeah, it really helps, it, it just really helps with paying attention. So I, like, when I joked at the start, like, my attention for the natural world has increased a lot since giving up tech. Thanks, Mark. Um, I was thinking about despair and resilience. Uh, one of the things that Home is really um, working with at the moment is ideas of resilience, resilience for creatures and species, but also resilience for people. Um, so I suppose I'm thinking about like the weight, the weight of carrying all of this, um, just the weight of carrying the world. Mary um, yesterday described herself as sensitive, and I think that's a strange word that we use a lot. We talk about people being sensitive. And really, it means that we, we can see, we see what's going on. We're not pretending otherwise, really. So um, for me, sensitivity is actually a, a wisdom. Um, but that wisdom of seeing how the world is leaves you very vulnerable to the world. So would you would you describe yourself as sensitive? <laughs> like a sense of new age guy, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm actually like, I can be quite insensitive sometimes. <laughs> Probably a bit abrasive, um, especially when I do these kind of talks so I can I can talk about um, about hard matters sometimes, so maybe I'm not sensitive enough. But um, would I be sensitive? Yeah, like a, yeah, like yeah, I love the natural world. Um, yeah, it's yeah, it's um, it's really hard when you see something you love, um, being really harmed. Um, like I went through, I've gone through many phases in my life. That, like, I've gone through a phase where I wanted to blow up everything. You know, being honest, like I've seen the violence of. Of the society, I just thought this shit needs to go. You know, I'm not in that phase anymore. I'm talking this honestly because, to be honest about the you know, cycles we go through, that was that was one of my earliest kind of reactions to what I seen happening. Um, I've come to a very different place now. Oh, what about despair? Do you do you have phases of despair? Um, not anymore. No, I used to. Oh, I tell us about that. How do you fix that one then? How do you get rid of eco despair? <laughs> Um, I think it's I think it's really about focusing on what's beautiful and what's left, and just giving your time to that. You know, because I've gone through the phase of focusing on the negative stuff. Like Alan spoke very beautifully about this last night. Um, because we're especially in social media and the media world of things, it's just bad news the whole time, bombarded. You know, and it's it's very very difficult to resist that. Um, it can get to. Um, the other thing about unplugging from that world of things is you don't get that every day. You know, um, I wake up in the morning to bird song. Just, but I, I live in a cabin and I, I have an amazing up top for sleep. Um, and I wake up in the morning and it's just like an unbelievable amount of bird song. Um, I don't wake up to looking at Twitter feed. Um, and so 
I'm not exposed so much to the things that make you despair, and I'm more and I'm more exposed to the things that give you hope. Um, and I can see from my own small building, for example, I live in a three-acre small building, and when I've seen the difference in the place in the last ten years, you know, I, when I first got the small building, I'd done the same thing most people do: I cleared off everything, got the sides out, went nuts, typical man. Um, and um, after about a year, I realised, what the hell am I doing? Like, I've just made the place worse. Um, by trying to manicure the whole thing, I was like, I wasn't using much tech, but it was still like, it was a, you know, it was, a, it was pretty bad control job. And now we do as little control as possible. Um, we clear the bits around before we grow food and stuff. We we interfere as little as possible. And the amount of um, insect life and bird life and so on there is phenomenally different than when I first got there. Um, so, so yeah, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, I, I no longer try to do the spare things, just focus on what you can do. Like every single moment you engage with somebody, there's an opportunity to move somebody, uh, an opportunity to have an amazing interaction of some sort. Same with the natural world, you know, just go through the world in that way. Focus on what's beautiful, focus on what remains, uh, because there's nothing we can do about what we've already done. Uh, it's just like, how, how, where can we go from here and, and make the world as beautiful a place as you can? Thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm picking up. Do you want to thank you for saying you, You've thought and written a lot about wildness, talked a lot about wildness. I wonder if we could just dip into anything you've discovered around wildness. I, I have a sense that um, oft, we often talk about the wild and we don't really have a particularly strong relationship with our own wildness. Who's to blame? Come on, own up. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Uh, it's, it's the tech thing. Spooks. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Like human wildness is a little bit unexplored in a way. We see, we see it all of the time, kind of manifesting, breaking out, doing different things. Uh, we've sanitized a lot of our wildness so, so we don't really notice the harm that we're doing to a lot of things. It comes wrapped up in plastic or, you know, somebody else is doing the, the messy stuff for us. So maybe just talk a little bit about your sense of wildness in and out. Yeah, like I think, yeah, because we often think about wildness as being a land, like a, in the landscape of wildlife and that kind of stuff, but I think it's also an inner state. Um, um, like it, civilization has been trying to control wildness since its inception. Um, and I think, yeah, for me it's, for me, it's all about control. Like we're, we're, we're a very controlling species. If you really want to control the world around us, men do this to women, um, we do it to the landscapes. And we've got to give up control because we don't really know very much. Like we're not, like we're, when we're, when we're controlling things, we're, we're, we're just coming from a very limited experience from our own heads, thinking that we know everything. Like we know what the purpose of this species is, we know what this is for, and we try to control it. We, we haven't got a clue. Um, and what I've found is that the more you, the more you relinquish control, the more life becomes, you know? Like, it's just that simple. And so, um, we all know when we move into a wild landscape too. Like, you can, you can, you can just feel the light in it. Um, it's, you, when you get into kind of definitions of wild and what wild is, well, it's very hard to define these things. Um, but it's almost like a state of being. Um, like the Taoists might call it the way. Um, I sometimes call it being in a kind of a magical zone, you know, where you're just moving through the world. And things make sense, like you know, like you think of something and a few minutes later it happens, and <laughs> you can't explain it logically, like you know, it's a kind of a magical realm. Um, and there's all sorts of different, you know, different traditions of different words for this. Um, I also call that the well as well as being in a kind of wild state of being and moving through the world in that way, not trying to control the people around you, not trying to control your landscape, letting things be, um, and seeing what happens. And life it can be that simple. Great. So wildness, magic, beauty. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a good, good recipe for tonight as well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. That we're we're going to close that there. Mark, thanks so much. That's really, really beautiful. Yeah. We're going to move over toward the panel. So maybe we'll just thank Mark for that. Beautiful. <laughs>